Thanks for your patience. <laughs> Thanks for all of you joining and also be, be very patient. <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening and uh, welcome you all to this one of the uh, very important and essential topic of uh, today's virtual uh, education series organized by the Journal of Handle Microsurgery on the topic broken scaphoid, uh, scaphoid fracture and non-union. Uh, I'm very thankful and grateful to Dr. Amit Gupta, uh, who swiftly accepted our invitation uh, to talk on this subject. A uh, few words about Dr. Amit Gupta. I've uh, grown um, learning and reading the growing hand of Dr. Amit Gupta. And uh, in fact, uh, any reference we used to, uh, during our fellow time, we used to call Dr. Amit article, and then we get good uh, uh, reference and good volume of uh, knowledge. Uh, that much I can say that um, such a wonderful and a great teacher um, and a wonderful surgeon, which we happen to see him uh, uh, in uh, writings, in literatures, and in, of course in website, not in uh, in person. And it's such a wonderful opportunity to see him, uh, listen to his talk, and uh, share, I mean, gain uh, whatever knowledge possible uh, ourselves and the viewers. Also, uh, we are joined today with uh, Dr. Olivia Mertz. I think uh, uh, I am one of the greatest followers of Dr. Olivia. Though I have not met him, uh, I used to see all his uh, videos and surgical uh, procedures and publications in uh, uh, the uh, LinkedIn. Uh, really amazed to see him uh, today that he has joined us with us. Uh, and last but not the least, uh, Dr. Ignacio Relen, uh, or the close friend of uh, Dr. Origo Burrito. Uh, he also referred and said he's one of the finest uh, uh, hand surgeon who's well experienced in the field of uh, scaphoid and other reconstructive procedures. So today, uh, we'll be having a, a talk by Dr. Amit. Uh, if possible, we'll have a talk at the end by Dr. Olivia, a few couple of uh, minutes, and then we will have a couple of discussions on uh, this uh, very vital topics for uh, orthopedic surgeons. Uh, the hand surgeons and also the plastic surgeons and budding surgeons. Uh, thank you one and all. Please uh, uh, join and uh, let's welcome Dr. Amit uh, to give his talk. Dr. Amit, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Terence. Um, thank you for inviting me. And um, we're going to talk about the broken scaphoid. Um, a lot of the stuff that I'll tell you is from the literature and the evidence base, but it's also based on my experience uh, of about 300 scaphoid fractures and about 300 scaphoid non-unions. So the scaphoid is from a Greek word, the scaphoidius, which is uh, the Latin word scaphoidius and also the Greek word, uh, which is also scaphoidius. This is uh, called a boat shape. Uh, first, uh, in Galen uh, was born in Greece and moved to Rome, and he said the corpus had uh, eight rows, uh, two rows with eight bones. It was Vesalius, the great uh, anatomist in his De Humani Corporis Fabrica in 1543, uh, who, uh, this is the frontispiece of that, and who uh, showed that the corpus has eight bones. And Michael Leiser uh, from Leipzig named the corpal bones, and these were his names. Uh, Ronken, it was only uh, in 1896, when Rongen described x-rays that people could actually see the carpal bones. And we must mention Etienne Desto, uh, who was um, you know, in France, in Lyon, and he got the x-ray machine uh, just a few months after Rongen described the uh, x-rays. Now, the next part is going to be in the anatomy, and this is the uh, book, uh, just put, putting a plug in for our book, The, the, Gro the Grasping Hand. Terence mentioned uh, the growing hand, the grasping hand is an anatomy book, uh, a work done that, uh, at Louisville uh, for 20 years. So the scaphoid is uh, in the first row and it forms a link between the first and the second row of bones. Um, and uh, here on the scaphoid, most of it is covered by cartilage and there's that dorsal ridge which has got a lot of vascular supply. Here you can see the vascular supply and the dorsal ridge, and most of the scaphoid is covered by cartilage. Uh, it has uh, scaphoid the dorsal scaphoid intrastus ligament, uh, the uh, ligament between the uh, scaphoid and the lunate, uh, and then the uh, palmar ligament that you can see here uh, between the scaphoid and the lunate. 
On the dorsal side, you have the wrist ligaments, the dorsal intercarpal ligament and dorsal uh, radio uh, carpal ligament or dorsal radio triquetral ligament. And the scaphoid is in this space in between. Uh, on the volar side, you have the uh, radio scaphoid capitate ligament, long radio lunate ligament, and the scaphoid is right here. This long radio lunate ligament has many components. Uh, again, coming to the dorsum, you have the dorsal um, scaphoid lunate, uh, scaphoid triquetral ligament, dorsal intercarpal ligament, uh, and there is a deeper ligament called the dorsal um, scaphoid triquetral ligament, which which we'll come to a little bit later. On the palmar side, you have the different parts of the um, uh, radioscaphoid capitate ligament, RCL, the RCB, RCB, the radio uh, uh, scaphoid capitate, uh, and the radioscaphoid triquetral ligament, and this is the long radiolunate ligament. Uh, uh, here again, now you can see the scaphoid and the lunate, the um, interosseous scaphoid lunate ligament, the dorsal part of the scaphoid lunate ligament, and this is the volar part of the scaphoid lunate ligament. Uh, here, on from the looking from the inside, you see the scaphoid and you see the intrusive scaphoid ligament, and this is the ligament of test two. Now, if you look, take out the uh, <clears throat> uh, distal row, you'll see the uh, dorsal uh, intercarpal ligament and the palmar intercarpal ligament, or the dorsal scaphoid triquetral ligament and the palmar scaphoid triquetral ligament. These are very important because they form a nice, thick. Um, uh, uh, area for the mid-carpal joint to, to be in there. In terms of uh, vascular supply, comes from the mostly from the radial artery, and you have the first dose of uh, one, two ICSRA coming across here, the dorsal radius, uh, uh, radial arch, and then you have the distal uh, uh, radial arch, and you have the distal intercarpal arch coming across here and supplying the scaphoid, and we'll come to that later. In terms of epidemiology, it said that uh, it's 38 per 100,000 males per year and 8 per 100,000 females per year and forms 79% of the carpal bone fractures, according to my friend Klaus Larsen. And you can see that in the, in the early phase, in the 15, 20 years, there's a big spike of uh, fractures in this area. The distribution is uh, um, waste is the most commonly fractured area. Uh, the mechanism of injury is forcible extension, and this has been shown by multiple uh, works, uh, clinical works, and also by a biomechanical work by Weber and Chow from the Mayo Clinic. And forcible flexion only in 3%. Is dorsiflexion low to the radial half of the palm with the wrist stabilized in 90 or 100 degrees of extension? So what happens, this uh, thick ligament on the volar side and the uh, ligament on the dorsal side traps the proximal pole, and then you get an hyperextension extension, uh, uh, me uh, moment to the distal pole. So here you have the volar, thick volar ligaments. This is the scaphoid. Then you have the thick palm, uh, dorsal ligaments, and that traps the proximal pole, and there is an hyperextension moment to the, um, to the distal pole. Now, Barton said, uh, Nicholas Barton from Nottingham said, we may think that we know all we need to know about fractures of the scaphoid. The reverse is true. Most of what we have been taught and we therefore believe we know is unproven, and much of it is actually untrue. Many questions about the diagnosis and management remain uh, unanswered. He said that in 1989, and he wrote a fantastic article called 20 Questions About Scaphoid Fractures, Nicholas Barton. Uh, and I would uh, encourage everyone to read this article. And we are trying to expand on this and forming a book called The Broken Scaphoid. It's written by me and three of my other friends, Chai Mudgal, uh, Randy Bindra, and Joe Dias. And this is going to come out later in the year or perhaps next year. Um, so why do we fix scaphoids? We're trying to prevent this uh, bad outcome, which is non-union of the scaphoid, and this resulting in SNAC or scaphoid non-union advanced collapse or arthritis of the wrist. So this is the index case. This is a 16 year old person fell into an outstretched hand while playing soccer. He presents to the emergency department with pain and swelling in the right wrist. There is swelling over the snuff box and intense tenderness over the dorsal of the wrist and over the scaphoid tubercle. I want you to think about these, uh, look at these x-rays and think about them. So ER radiographs, are here, uh, not much on the uh, on this view. On the lateral, you can't see much. There's an oblique view, not much to be seen. Anyway, 
The patient was splinted and asked to make an appointment with the hand office. He came to the office three weeks after sustaining the injury. Pain and swelling in the snub box persists. Tenderness of the scaphoid tubercle and the snub box. There is decreased range of motion of the wrist. At that time, X-rays were taken, and you can see the scaphoid is flexed. There's a ring sign. There is a great DZ deformity. Now, what are we going to do? So keep thinking about it. So the basic facts: this most common carpal fracture is young male, 90% of the rate, uh, union rate generally. Uh, assuming proper diagnosis and proper treatment. Mechanism is high force, fallen outstretched hand, hyperextension of the wrist, more than 90 degrees. So how do we diagnose a scaphoid fracture? By physical exam, x-ray, scaphoid series, special studies, CD, and MRI, and possibly bone scan, but not much is done these days. So there's this thing called Duckworth criteria. Uh, Andrew Duckworth from Edinburgh, talked about it, and in this paper, the classic, uh, this has become a quite a paper now, and it's said that there's a snuff box tenderness on ulnar deviation at three days, scaphoid tubercle tenderness at two weeks, male and sports injury. If you have four factors, there's a very high incidence that this will be a scaphoid fracture. So again, snuff box tenderness on ulnar deviation at three days, scaphoid tubercle tenderness at two weeks, male and a sports injuries. And then you talk about the radiology. In terms of imaging, we do the radiographs, PA, lateral, 45 degree oblique, scaphoid views, which is ulnar deviated, clenched fist views. Um, and we can do other things like CT scans and MRI. We'll talk a little bit about that. So these are the x rays that we do, the uh, films called, there's a film, a special view called the Zyter view, PA view, PA with ulnar deviation, that brings the scaphoid in profile semi-oblique, semi-pronated oblique, lateral view, and clenched fist supinated view. Then there's a Zyter view. If you have a scaphoid fracture through the waist, if you put your x-ray through here, uh, this will be obscured. If you then extend the wrist, then the scaphoid fracture comes into profile and, uh, and lines up with the uh, ray. And then you can, if you oblique, if you do, um, uh, tilt it about 20 degrees, you get a better film. So this is ulnarly deviated, the uh, uh, X-ray machine is tilted 20 degrees and you get this thing called the Zyter view. You can see the scaphoid distal pole. You can see uh, it, it can be a um, ring sign if the uh, wrist is radially deviated, the scaphoid is flexed now. Or you can see the edge of the radius that can uh, uh, fool you seeing that it's a scaphoid fracture. This shows the edge of the radius in a patient who has a cyst in the scaphoid. This is called the Mach effect. So what about MRI? MRI has a sensitivity of 98%. If the MRI says no fractures, it's 100% reliable, okay? Specificity is 99% uh, and accuracy is 96%. So if you have an MRI, this is T1 view and this is T2, and you can see that uh, x-rays were negative, but you can see that there's edema and there is possibly a scaphoid fracture. The MRI role, the prevalence is uh, low, uh, lowering the pretest probability. There is no reference. Standard for a fracture making is hard to compare to a positive test. But all told, MRI is the best test despite the possibility of false positive. What about CT scan? Sensitivity is 94%, specificity is 96%, accuracy of 98%. Bone scan, sensitivity of 96%. Ultrasound, sensitivity of 93%. And you can see the fractures. You need a very good trained ultrasound person to do this. There's a new uh, investigation called dual energy CT, and that's very, very accurate compared to MRI and conventional CT. You see the MRI edema there, CT, you couldn't see anything. And in dual energy CT, you see uh, this. And here again, MRI T1, MRI STIR, and conventional CT and DCT. What about CT? Do you have to put it in the uh, plane of the scaphoid? Of course, uh, you can, but with modern CTs, uh, you really don't need to because they can reformat. And this is the study which shows that you can, uh, the, uh, the films can be reformatted to show in the plane of the scaphoid. And then when you reformat that, you can see incomplete uh, or you can see evidence of scaphoid healing. 
So carrying on with our story of this patient that we talked about, uh, remember that patient we talked about, the 16-year-old patient who fell, who went to the ER, uh, negative x-rays, and then came three weeks later to the um, office with pain and swelling in the snuff box. And here you see the scaphoid is flexed, the lunate is dorsiflexed, and then we take a CT, and then you see a humpback scaphoid, a flap scaphoid. This is creating the DZ deformity, and this will definitely go into non-union. And here is, a, here is the uh, DZ deformity, and here is the humpback deformity of the scaphoid with increased interscaphoid angles. So at this point, we talk about fracture classification. Distal pole fractures, fractures of the tubercle, fractures of the distal pole, uh, transverse fracture of the waist, horizontal oblique fracture, slightly obliquity of the uh, fracture, uh, vertical oblique fracture, a proximal pole fracture. So Bauman and Campbell classified the transverse fracture, 60%. Horizontal oblique is about 35%. Vertical oblique is uh, 5%. Transverse is the best outcome because it uh, you can get uh, good compression. Herbert classified this into acute fracture stable. He considered stable to be very small amount of scaphoid fractures, tubercle fractures, uh, incomplete waist fracture, and everything else was unstable. It is very important to understand this. Waist fracture, complete like this, very clearly unstable. Transverse fracture of the waist, uh, he also considered that unstable. Although it can be stable to a certain extent, proximal pole fracture here and transcaphoid perilunate dislocation of the corpus. This is Herbert's classification. So the take home message is suspect a scaphoid fracture with snub box tenderness, even if radiographs are negative after two weeks. You probably cannot go wrong with a non contrast MRI, even if it's early. You may discover other injuries like scaphoid ligament injuries. While many fractures are ultimately fixed, the important win for the patient is actually discovering the fracture. So uh, the preventable causes of scaphoid non-union are failure to recognize the fracture, inadequate initial treatment, and improper assessment of bone healing. So failure to diagnose. In Cambridge series from Radford in 1990, the 54% of the non-unions did not have adequate initial treatment. In our series in 1999, 65% did not have adequate treatment. And then Wong and von Schroeder in 2011 um, analyzed this a little bit more. In their series, 50% did not have adequate initial treatment. And this is our paper from 1999, which showed that uh, patients had 65% patients didn't have adequate initial treatment. Now let's look at von Schroeder's paper a little bit uh, uh, carefully, that 88 cases of scaphoid non-union, 57 sought immediate medical treatment, uh, 27 with delayed presentation, 13 had uh, presentation more than four weeks, and 31 of them sought no medical treatment. So look at this, 13 had more than four weeks, 31 no medical treatments. And even if you seek medical treatment, eight did not have radiographs, were not treated for scaphoid fracture. So ultimately the conclusion is, the patient's factor contributed to non-union in 51%. Half of the patients did not seek treatment. And physician factors, surgeons, or ER doctors, somebody missed the fracture in 17%. This is, these are very important elements. So we talked about it. But sometimes what happens, we find a fracture, we treat it in a cast, then we take the cast off uh, up eight weeks, 10 weeks, and say, oh, the fracture is healed. Now, has it healed? Can you tell? with a good quality x-rays at 12 weeks of the fractures healed. Well, my friend Joe Dias did a classic study in 1988. He took 20 sets of good quality x-rays at 12 weeks post-injury. He sent it to his eight good friends, four orthopedic surgeons, four radiologists. And two months later, he flipped them around and sent the same x-rays, relabeled them, and sent, to the, sent it to the same observers. And look what he found. Not only did they not agree with each other, they did not agree with themselves. They didn't agree with their previous opinion. So the kappa value was so out of whack that radiographs at 12 weeks do not provide reliable and reproducible evidence of healing. So if you, if you discard immobilization, saying that this is healed, the patient may come back after a year or so with uh, a small injury, and probably it's a non-union which persisted from the time. 
So can we find out characteristics of the scaphoid fracture that point to a bad outcome and pick those and fix those fractures? Well, we can. Literature has shown, shown that displaced fracture and comminuted fractures are uh, not going to heal. So Leslie and Dickinson show that clearly. Unstable fractures don't heal. Fractures with carpal instability and deformity don't heal, and proximal pole fractures don't heal. Those, these are the bad actors. And if you don't get anything out of this lecture, remember these four things, and I'll repeat it again and again today. So displaced fractures and comminuted fractures, unstable fractures, fractures with carpal instability and deformity, and proximal fractures. What about displaced fractures? Well, displaced and comminuted fractures, more than 1% displacement increases chances of non-union, 19% non-union. More than 1%, 92% non-union, less than 1%, 63% non-union, and 0% display, zero mm displacement is 13% non-union. So there's a big difference. Dyson and Singh, all these people uh, showed uh, the same thing. So this is uh, clearly uh, exaggerated displacement, but this will require uh, fixation. This is also displaced, will require fixation. This is displaced, more than one millimeter will require displacement. So undisplaced fracture, what is a truly undisplaced fracture? Lack of any displacement. Scaphoid angle less than 60 degrees, uh, interscaphoid angle. These are things that you will find on the CT. So you need to, uh, if you really want to see a truly undisplaced fracture, you have to get a CT. And you have to do this uh, interscaphoid angles in, in both planes. And they have to be less than 15 degrees and less than 10 degrees in different planes. So the sensitivity of CT increases. Plain radiographs are not that sensitive. CT, you can get a sen great sensitivity about displacement. Um, and displaced fractures, odds of non-union 17 times when displaced fractures are treated in a plaster cast compared to surgery. And this was shown by uh, Dr. Singh and Dr. Dias's paper. Now, if you treat displaced fractures operatively, um, uh, then you decrease the chances of non-union. 93% healed in a cast. So displaced fractures have four times higher risk of non-union. Then there is comminuted fractures. These are, these are classically unstable. It takes a great force to produce a comminuted fracture. So if you have comminuted fracture, you have to fix these, and they will go on to a uh, good result. Comminuted fracture here, and it's fixed, and goes on to heal. So this was a great paper by Ruby Graywall, Nina Sue, and Joe McDermott, uh, Joy McDermott. And they showed that if you have humpback, a deformity, as you showed in our index case, there's a 7%, seven times increased risk of non-union. There's a translation of displacement, there's 3.4 times uh, chance of non-union, and there's comminution, there's 2.5 times chance of non-union. And they showed that standard non-displaced fracture will heal in 48 days in a cast. You add 29 days if you have comminution. You add 45 days to that if you have translation. And add 102 days to that if you have sclerosis. And 46 more days if you have a proximal fall fracture. So you see that the, um, uh, the time to, in a cast increases tremendously if you have all these other problems that we talked about. What about unstable fractures? Um, you know, uh, Herbert said everything else is unstable except uh, tubercle and distal pole fractures, which I've come to believe actually. Uh, unstable fractures, if you have vertical oblique fractures, so what happens that if you have a vertical oblique fracture, transverse fracture, the, the, if you put in a cast, they'll get a compressive force. If you're horizontal oblique, uh, they can be a little stable, but vertical oblique, there's a displacement. And instability can be, again, shown on CT scan or on arthroscopy. So CT scan, as compared to plain radiographs, increases the sensitivity uh, and accuracy of diagnosis. But if you really want to see instability, then um, even completely non-displaced, non-angulated, non-comminuted scaphoid fractures by CT have been found to have a third incidence of instability if you examine them arthroscopically. So you have a fracture like this uh, or a fracture like this, which is fairly undisplaced, and then you do uh, an arthroscopy, uh, and what you'll see? You'll see that there is, uh, in the radiocarpal arthroscopy, radiocarpal view, uh, you see the, scaph the fragment there, and you see the scaphoid 
all right there loose bone fragments like so um, and mid carpal view you go further and you'll see the scaphoid fragments really moving so it's not stable fractures even though on the, on the ct and on the x-rays they show uh quite a lot of stability so a third of the ones that are shown in CT to be completely non-displaced, non-comminated. If you scope them with a mid-couple scope, you'll be able to see instability to the fragment. So most of the scapegoat fractures are really unstable, and stability is the key for uh, union. So fractures with carpal instability. If you have a trans perilunate dislocation, or if you have fractures with a humpback, with a DZ deformity, these are inherently unstable and must be fixed primarily. So these two fragments are in two different towns. You really have to bring them together and fix them to get any form of union. Then the last one is proximal pole fractures. These are notoriously bad actors, and uh, Rettig and Raskin found that they have a high rate of non-union if treated in a cast, and if you fix them primarily, they heal well. So should, uh, should you treat proximal pole fractures operatively? The answer is yes. There's about a 30% th chance of non-union when treated non-operatively. So proximal pole fractures like this, they must be uh, reduced and fixed uh, with screws like this, and uh, this will go on to he heal. Uh, according to Eastley, this is 7.5% chances of uh, non-union. So here is a 19-year-old patient who is a soccer player hit by a soccer ball. Patient has a fracture of the scaphoid proximal pole, fairly, fairly non-displaced. But when you open it, and I, this is a 14 gauge angiocath, and I put it from the dorsal side with the mini open, and look, it's, it's, it was displaced. And then you put a, a guide wire down the middle, center center, and then you can put a screw across and compress it. And this goes on to heal very nicely. So poor prognostic indicators are displaced and comminuted fractures, unstable fractures, fractures with carpal instability and deformity, and proximal pole fractures. So these are the poor prognostic indicators. So indications for primary ORIF in my mind is displaced comminuted fractures, unstable fractures, fractures with carpal instability and deformity, and proximal pole fractures. So these are the take-home message. These are the ones that need require early treatment, and you need to do early assessment of proper bone healing. So my algorithm now is if you have unstable displaced humpback and I go for surgery straight away, if they're stable uh, with CT scan, then we do casting for four to six weeks, CT with healing, begin motion. And we'll, dis uh, uh, we'll discuss a little bit later. So there have been a lot of studies comparing cast versus surgery, early surgery. And here was a uh, paper from Mayo Clinic. Um, uh, uh, Alex Shin was there. Percutaneous screws, seven weeks time to union, cast immobilization, 11 weeks, no difference in range of motion, grip strength, and patient satisfaction. Uh, paper from uh, Edinburgh, percutaneous screw, 9.2 weeks time to union, cast immobiliz immobilization, 13.9 weeks time to union, no difference in grip strength and pinch strength. But let's look at this huge study. This is called the SWIFT study. The SWIFT study it was published in Lancet. Uh, very rarely do we get in orthopedic literature or in hand surgery literature a chance to uh, look at Lancet. And this is done by my friend, Dr. Joe Dyes. And they had 408 patients in a multi-center study. They took fractures displacement less than one millimeter. 203 patients had surgery, 205 patients had casting. They did PRWE at 52 weeks. And then they had pain function, uh, SF12 bone union by radiologists, range of motion, grip strength, and complications. So primary outcomes and secondary outcomes. So let's look at that. Um, and so what is the, uh, this is a pragmatic parallel group, multi-center, open level, randomized uh, study. A uh, huge number of patients, uh, very well uh, done. Uh, surgery had more complications. There was no difference in union rate. Reoperation and complications more in surgery group. They did a CT at 52 weeks in this uh, in these patients, and they had a screw penetration in a huge number of their um, uh, surgical patients. And there was no difference in return to work. 
no significant difference between cast and surgery in non-displaced scaphoid fracture. So if you have a non-displaced scaphoid fracture, you can very easily and very nicely treat them in a cast. Now, the very important thing is 73 scaphoids. You'll need to uh, treat 73 scaphoids surgically to avoid one non-union. Think of it, 73 to one. To avoid one non-union, you need to treat, treat 73 patients surgically. But even then, surgery has higher complication rate. So we talked about it. If it's displaced less than two millimeters or less, you should have cast immobilization. What type of cast? Well, Nigel Clay and Joe Dye showed that there's no difference between a scaphoid cast and a Collins cast. And I put a scaphoid cast myself and I put a Collins cast myself. I tell you, the scaphoid cast with the thumb is very difficult to wear for the patient for about eight, 10 weeks. Very difficult. So I put my patients in a Collis cast now since there's no difference in a prospective randomized trial. There are a lot of good articles from Nottingham, and this is from uh, Tim Davis's unit with Jay Hogan and, um, and Dawson and Downing and others, which showed that you can immobilize these non displaced fractures in four weeks, and then the CT at four weeks will show you whether it's healed, partially healed, or not healed. If it's 50% healed, you can let them go. With a little, uh, you can uh, discontinue the cast because the scaphoid is strong enough. So CT scan at four weeks, gentle range of motion, and then some of them required four more weeks uh, or surgery, depending on if they develop uh, cysts or develop displacement, or you pick up some of these other things. So 25 or 26 union with four weeks of immobilization in the uh, in their series. So here's a patient, six weeks in a my patient, 25 year old motorcycle accident. A uh, patient has non-displaced, look at that, non-displaced fracture uh, completely. Non-displaced fracture, almost incomplete. Patient was put in a cast for six weeks, and here's a CT at six weeks, completely healed. Completely healed, into scaphoid angles are good. So displaced fracture, this is another article from uh, Nick Downing and Tim Davis from the same unit in Nottingham. And they show that at uh, four weeks CT scan, you can see partial union, 50% union here, or complete union as it's been sh shown here. Or you'll see these things, you'll see fracture gap, or you'll see sclerosis, or you'll see cystic dieback or bone absorption. If you see these, you just pick those guys out and just put a screw across them, but rest, you can fix them. So what do you do at that point? You can do dorsal percutaneous scan related screw fixation for delayed Non-union. And this is our paper, uh, PRNS. And this is how I do it. I you can do percutaneous or a mini open from the dorsum. Uh, if the fracture is in the waist or towards the proximal pole, I use a 14 gauge angiocath now because the otherwise the uh, K wire bed tends to bend a little bit, and you have to go from the ulnar side towards the abducted thumb. So the thumb is abducted and um, and uh, deviated, and you you uh, aim for the thumb. And there you go, and then you take x-rays, and it show the center center in two planes. Then you open it up, and you put a screw across it, and here it is, uh, fixing it with the screw. And here is, again, another patient, um, and another patient, all fixed, and goes on to heal without any problems. So you can do this, or if you want to see instability and if you want to reduce it, you can do it with the arthroscope uh, and uh, put the arthroscope in the mid carpal joint. Here's the, arthros the, here's the uh, fracture which is displaced quite a bit, and you put a mid carpal scope and you reduce the fracture, then you put these K wires and then you put a screw across it. Um, so the fracture is now reduced. So from here, displaced fracture to reduce fracture and fix. If you have a cyst, you can put a, look through the mid carpal joint uh, to, uh, and you can uh, put in some bone graft with the Jamshidi needle and put a screw across it. Some of the bone graft has escaped out here. And here's a fracture which is treated with a arthroscopic fixation and goes on to heal. And here it is. So we, we come back to our, uh, our uh, index case. Uh, remember that kid with 16 year old uh, fell initially, x rays were normal and pain and swelling in the snuff box. And at three weeks, it showed that the scaphoid was flexed, lunate was dorsiflexed, and there's a big humpback deformity. What do you do now? Now here, you can't percutaneously fix this. This has to be corrected. The geometry of the scaphoid has to be fixed. 
So we open it from the volar side, we open up the scaphoid and we put in a graft because there'll be a gap here and we put in a graft here. And then you can put K wires. This guy wanted to go to the military and wanted the wires removed. So uh, they, they won't take him in the military if he has a screw in there. So I, we decided to put K wires. It doesn't matter. This will heal as long as you reconstruct the geometry of the scaphoid in two planes. And here it is healed completely and he has full range of motion and he went back, went to the military. Case two, uh, this patient is a soccer player, NCAA, kicked in the right wrist. Patient has an oblique, a vertical oblique fracture and you can see vertical oblique fracture goes on, was put in a cast because she wanted to play. And we've got a cyst formation, cystic dieback. This was shown by George Perkins. Um, and here you see on the CT scan, this is not gonna heal. So we put in a screw fixed from the dorsal side, compression, and the patient goes on to uh, play and has full range of motion. Displaced fracture, unstable fracture. This 50 year old patient uh, in a motor vehicle accident, right wrist pain, um, and x-ray shows no fractures. Uh, and then again, splinted and then uh, shows another scaphoid fracture initially. So here's a scaphoid fracture, but this is a five millimeter gap uh, displacement. So here on the x-rays, screw fixation goes on to heal. Unstable fracture, humpback deformity, corporal instability, 20 year old fracture, uh, 20 year old patient. Look at this, displaced humpback deformity. This, the geometry needs to be corrected. Otherwise this is not gonna heal. Look at the DZ deformity. So the patient has a volar approach, open this up, correct the geometry, grafted and fixed with a screw, and this goes on to heal quite well. Proximal pole fracture, 21 year old patient, injured left wrist while playing football, pain over the left wrist, snub box tenderness, and here's a proximal pole fracture, fixed primarily with a screw, goes on to heal. Displaced fracture, this patient is 63 year old, but displaced. So it, the fracture is distal, so I use a, a distal approach and I use a 14 gauge angiocath. You put the 14 gauge angiocath and it'll show you that you're going center center on this. So it's a percutaneous fixation and this will also help to lever the trapezium out, um, uh, out of the way and then you put a center center and you can produce in your mind's eye where this uh, screw is going to go, okay? in both planes, and then you put a guide wire, and then you put the screw across, and here it is fixed, and he goes home. Delayed union, cystic dieback, 18-year-old patient, you see the cystic dieback happening, and you fix it with a, with a screw, and it goes on to heal with the CT scan in full range of motion. So take home messages, diagnostic criteria, snub box tendonitis, ulnar deviation at three days, Scaphoid tubercle tendon at two weeks, male sports injury, high index of suspicions for scaphoid fracture. Radiology, um, x-rays and multiple views, including scaphoid views and the Zyter view, MRI, CT scan in special instances, MRI if the, the CT scan, if the x-rays are negative or you keep having doubt about a scaphoid fracture. And immediate fixation indications are displaced fracture, comminated, unstable, fractures associated carpal instabilities, proximal pole fractures. And non-displaced fracture, short arm cast for six weeks, CT scan at six weeks, 50% united, doesn't matter. Uh, if you have displacement instability, gap, bone absorption, you need surgery. So here it is, this is uh, at six weeks, CT scan, and you can, if you see any of these, you go on for surgery. And I've shown you the uh, take home messages here that uh, we've, we've gone through them tremendously. Surgical treatment, dorsal percutaneous, volar percutaneous, mini open dorsal approach, or traditional volar roos approach. There are options for plating and for com complex scaphoid fractures, you can do bone grafting. So my algorithm is this, that if you have a snuff box tenderness with negative plane films, you can cast it for 10 to 14 days, or you put a very high index of suspicion, you do an MRI. Repeat x-rays or non-contrast MRI, no fractures, if it continues to have pain, do an arthroscopy. If they have no pain, full range of motion, let them go. If there's a fracture, it goes on to, uh, if it's truly non-displaced with CT and arthroscopy, then you can, uh, of CT, not arthroscopy, then you can cast them, or you can do a screw fixation depending on the patient's preference. If there's a displaced fracture of any nature, then you do a screw fixation or arthroscopic screw fixation, ORIF, okay? Well, 
What's new in scaphoid fractures? Well, you can have targeting devices, you know, like everything else in the knee and all. Uh, Philippe Leverneau uh, from Strasbourg and Bolu from Beijing, they worked very hard on these targeting devices and they can get a center center fixation of the scaphoid using a very complex uh, targeting device. So that's scaphoid fractures. Um, Terence, you want to stop here or? Um... Uh, please, please go ahead, please go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so now we talk about non-unions, okay? So, Dr. London in 1961 in a JBGS publication said 95% of fresh fractures united proper initial management in this, uh, in this paper called The Broken Scaphoid, The Case Against Pessimism. But his follow-up was um, uh, that the, if the patients didn't show up in his office, they were, uh, they were deemed to have healed. That's not a good follow-up. So, the true, what is the true incidence of non-union? Leslie and Dickinson said 5%, Herbert and Fisher said 50%, but Joe Dias, again, uh, his uh, team uh, talks about 12.3%. And I think this is more true uh, incidence of non-union because this was a long-term study. So these things nearly unite. The distal pole fracture, the um, tubercle fracture, the distal pole fracture, transverse fracture through the waist, they all heal, nearly always unite. And these may not heal, the uh, vertical oblique, horizontal oblique, or the proximal pole fracture. So the, if you look at this, distal third, 100% union, middle third, 80% union, proximal third, 60% union. Stable fractures, 85% union, unstable fractures, 65% union. And we had this non-union of the distal pole. It's so rare that we got a publication out of it. So you can get, uh, you can get distal pole which uh, generally heal, but we had a publication showing the number of cases that didn't heal from our clinic. So preventable causes, we've gone through this, failure to recognize the fracture, inadequate initial treatment, improper assessment of bone healing. Uh, I've talked to you about all this. So age of the fracture, does delay in diagnosis matter? Well, Langloff and Anderson showed that the delay in diagnosis is less than four weeks, the union rates are the same as fresh fractures if you treat them in the cast. If delay in diagnosis is more than four weeks, then you have a problem. And we talked about improper assessment of bone healing. So why do scaphoids not heal? Well, there are intrinsic causes. One is interruption of blood supply. The blood supply of the scaphoid has been studied for a long time. Well, there was a paper uh, in 1938 by Oblitz and Hobstein. What they did was they took dried scaphoids and they counted the uh, foramina. And they found there's a whole bunch of foramen in the distal pole, there's some in the waist and very little in the proximal pole. Subsequently, Gelbern and Menon, Telesnik and Kelly did very sophisticated uh, Speltholz uh, clearance uh, studies of the uh, scaphoid with injection and showed very nice uh, studies. And this is uh, from Zenkoli's work where you see the distal pole uh, scaphoid supplied with the radial artery, the waist supplied by one artery, and the proximal pole is very avascular. And uh, uh, Steve Moran from uh, Mayo Clinic did this beautiful study where he injected the uh, scaphoid in the carpal bones and it did uh, uh, micro CTs of these and they showed beautiful uh, uh, vascular supply. So this is o Oblitz and Holbstein. They, they took dried scaphoids, looked at the scaphoids, distal pole, lots of foramina, prox um, waste, some foramina and proximal pole, hardly any. And then this is Zancoli's this is Zancoli's work, distal pole uh, supplied, prox um, wastes some vascular supply, and proximal pole fairly avascular. Uh, Gilbert and Menon, uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is showing the introsious vascularity. As you can see, distal pole good, waste is very good, proximal pole and artery. So if you have a fracture here, you'll get a problem. Here's a Moran study. Again, distal pole, vascularity, waist vascularity, proximal pole, relatively avascular. But if you compare a very sophisticated study from Moran with the Oblitz and Hobstein, you see the results are pretty much the same. Lots of uh, vascular supply in the distal pole, uh, some vascular supply in the waist, and very little supply in the, in the proximal pole. So the other causes, com combination of displacement, we talked about it, unstable fractures, we talked about it, fractures associated with carpal instability and proximal pole fractures. Well, in 1984 and 1985, there were these two articles, same uh, title in JBJS, Natural History of Scaphoid Non-Union by Dr. Mack, and one, this is by Dr. Ruby. 
So what they said was the, they called it the natural history of scaphoid non-unions, but they should have been called natural history of painful scaphoid non-unions because they only took the patients who came to their office. There may be a whole bunch of people in the population who have scaphoid non-unions, but are walking around fine with any problems. And this was pointed out in a very nice paper by my friend Steve McCabe, um, who showed that non-union is not always painful and we don't know the true population of scaphoid non-unions who are going around in the community. Be as it may, uh, what Dr. Ruby and Dr. Mack's paper showed that as years go by, five to nine years, 10 to 19 years, 29, 20 years or more, the displacement increases, the biomechanics are getting worse, radial unit angles get worse, scaphoid unit angles get worse, carpal height gets worse. So as time goes on, if you have a scaphoid non-unions, these angles get worse and the biomechanics of the wrist is getting bad and ultimately you end up with increased displacement, increased carpal instability and eventual arthritis and you end up with arthritis, a snack wrist. Okay, so. And this was shown by Lindstrom from Sweden that they did a longitudinal study. In Sweden, people don't move around too much. So they stay in the same town, the same village. And these, uh, and these guys were able to take 31 patients who did not want surgery and follow them longitudinally. They found that after 10 years of scaphoid fractures, 9%, if the scaphoid heal, 9% got some arthritis. If the scaphoid didn't heal, 93% got arthritis. So this is the one, this is the figure I use when I have to convince somebody that they need surgery. So 10% versus 100% almost. And they showed 100% incidence of arthritis in 10 to 17 years after diagnosis. This longitudinal population study of 33 non-unions followed for 10 to 17 years longitudinally with x-rays, okay? Now, how do you treat these? Well, there's this, um, um, People talk about Matty Roos procedure. Well, the Matty Roos, I think, is a myth. How did it start? The, the Herman Matty lived in a, in completely separate times. He lived in uh, and talked about a different operation. He he had he scooped this out, filled this with graft, and Otto Roos lived in Austria, and he put in cordial, cortical grafts uh, in there. And Herman Matty put Kinsella's grafts. Herman Matty lived in uh, Bern, but they have had good results over the years. Uh, the uh, results of roost grafting uh, has been very good. 98, 90, 100%. You can see that this is all roost grafting. Very good results over the years. And if you look at the literature. But then Jeffrey Fisk in 1968 in the Hunterian lecture talked about carpal instability. And he showed that if you have an acute fracture, they, go to, they can go into malunion, they can go to union, or they can go into non-union collapse deformity with DZ that lunate um, it goes into, hype, uh, into extension with the proximal pole of the scaphoid. And there is point loading in this volar side. This keeps on uh, flexing more and more, and therefore the interscaphoid angle changes and the couple collapse happens and the angles get all uh, out of whack. So this is a great paper from, from uh, Jeff Fisk. Uh, and he said, correction of flexion deformity of the scaphoid and restoration of the normal scaphoid length reestablishes the normal tension in the ligaments and corrects the pathological rotation of the lunate. So the Roos technique does not address the humpback scaphoid. It does not dis, uh, address unstable or displaced non-unions or the DZ deformity. So we have to treat this in a different fashion, and this is called the Fisk Fernandez. Diego Fernandez took Fisk's work and uh, expanded it, put bone graft, put a screw in there, and uh, this has been what, uh, what people have been doing, basically opening the scaphoid, restoring the geometry by comparing it to the opposite side and then putting a uh, measured bone graft. Initially, the cordiocancellus bone graft was there, and now people all put uh, cancellus, compact cancellus graft. You can do that, and you can put a screw or you can put a plate or whatever you want. Stabilization of some sort, even with K wires, but as long as you as you fix the geometry of the scaphoid. So you open up the scaphoid, proximal and distal poles, put in a bone graft like this, and put in a screw or whatever fixation you want. And this is the amount of defect that you have. This is the distal pole, this is the proximal pole, and this is the trapezoidal bone graft that we used to use uh, in the past. And you can get that from the crest, or you can get that 
uh, according to M Mark Garcia Elias, you can get that from the distal radius on the dorsal side. And here are examples, old examples with the Herbert screw fixation. Uh, and uh, the principle is the same. The scaphoids flexed in two planes. You open up the geometry of the scaphoid, but comparing to the opposite side, this is from Fernandez's work. And you measure and you um, put in a graft and you fix it or with K wires or with uh, with uh, uh, with the screws. So here's a distal pole, here's the proximal pole, and here's the graft, and you put in the sandwich graft. You crack the DZ deformity by extending the lunate, uh, by uh, flexing uh, the lunate, sorry, and then you fix it with to the radius with the K wire, and you crack the, there's a graft put in here, pro proximal pole here, distal pole here, and here's the screw going to be put in here, and that fixes it. And so, what are the factors affecting the outcome of this open reduction grafting and Herbert screw fixation? If the patient has the scaphoid fracture of five years or more, the chances of union are low. If there's a proximal third non-union, chances of the low. If there's sclerosis of the proximal fragment, the chances of union are low. If there's unsatisfactory reduction of the scaphoid in the carpal deformity, the chances of healing are low. What about if you do a graft and it fails? What is the fate of a failed bone graft? Union after second bone graft, the chances of union are less, 60% after a single bone graft. Chances are about over 80%. High percentage of symptomatic uh, problems despite union after second bone graft. Possibly salvage procedures are better. Uh, fracture location, AVN, and stability do not affect this uh, success rate. Um, what about an avascular scaphoid? Well, radiological diagnosis may be difficult. Lack of bleeding in the operation. Dr. Green talked about it, that that's avascular or dysvascular scaphoid. You should not talk about avascular necrosis because the scaphoid is never necrosed. Peter Carter used to use uh, um, allograft scaphoid. He used to take proximal pole scaphoids from allografts and he has showed union. So if a dead allograft from a bone bank in Miami can be fixed to a scaphoid in Texas, then surely patient's own scaphoid can revascularize. So lack of bleeding at the operation, MRI, um, and as, as I said, avascular fragments should unite, and after union, uh, they will revascularize. Here's a patient who has uh, no bleeding points, so only one possibly bleeding point here. This clearly shows uh, avascular or dysvascularity on the X, on the x-rays and here on the x-rays and MRI, you can see the changes of this vascularity. But if you fix them with the, with the screw, they will, they will revascularize. And so you can stop me anytime, Terrence. Yep, um, yep. Uh, five more minutes, probably we'll have some okay. questions. So yep. let's do a vascularized bone graft. What about vascularized bone graft? Here's a patient who has no punctate bleeding points, proximal pole non-union displaced. So why does a scaphoid, what is the, uh, you know, I'd look at the scaphoid fracture and the femoral neck fracture in a similar fashion. They both have tenuous blood supply, we know. They're both intercapsular fractures. So intercapsular fractures, there'll not be a fracture hematoma because there are these enzymes which dissolve the clot. And for fracture union, you need the fracture clot. There's no true periosteum, only the fibrous layer, no cambial layer. Fracture configurations are similar, and there's a high torque at the fracture site, which is difficult to control. So vascularized versus non-vascularized graft. Well, with, with uh, vas Merrill, Wolf, and Slade, they did a meta-analysis, and they showed that a vascularized bone graft at 88% union, non-vascularized bone graft at 47% union. So Dr. Hori uh, uh, pointed us towards this direction where she planted this uh, vascular um, uh, pedicle onto a bone and showed uh, growth of these uh, vessels which are going into the bone. And then Braun, Chacha, Zeidenberg, Sheets, they all talked about vascularized bone graft and showed us the way. So this is from Zeidenberg's work. Zeidenberg from Buenos Aires did a lot of work and showed the 1-2 ICSRA as a source of bone graft for the, um, for the scaphoid. And Sheets, Bishop, and Berger were really the ones who showed the anatomy of the distal radius and how we can take uh, bone graft. But there are other, other sources, ulnar arteries, palmal carpal arteries, dorsal metacarpal arteries, crest, 
You can do medial femoral artery and lateral femoral. So let's look at dorsal radius. One, two, ICSR, intercompartmental supraretinacular vessels. Two, second EC, two, three intercompartmental, second EC branch, fourth EC branch, all these things. And they have good vascularity in the depth of the radius. This is Zeidenberg's work. And here's the uh, schematic of the radial artery, ulnar artery, and all these blood vessels in the dorsum of the radius. This is 1, 2 ICSRA. This is second branch of 2, 3 ICSRA. This is fourth ICSRA. This is fifth intercompartmental between the compartments um, arteries. And ECA is inter, uh, inside the compartments. So here's the radial artery. This is superficial branch for radial artery. And here now is 1, 2 ICSR. In the first compartment, the tendons have been taken out. Second compartment, the ICSR. So you take bone graft from here and take it to the scaphoid. This will reach the scaphoid um, uh, up to the proximal pole, maybe up to the waist. But if you really need a good bone graft from the waist, you go here. I go take this fourth ECA and, and lift it up because it's got a long pedicle here. So you can, these are our injection studies, one, two ICS, sorry. So you can take bone graft from here. And this is all available in the uh, grasping hand. Huh? And so you can take it from here. So one, two ICS, sorry, or the fourth ICS, or a second. Okay, take it and you can, you can uh, pedicle it on this vessel connection. See, one, two ICS, sorry. All right. And then you can take it, if you have a distal um, graft, you can take graft from here. So you can take it, take graft from here for the for the waist of the scaphoid or for the lunate, and then you can clip this, and this will be your your supply line, okay? And graft is coming from here. On the palmar side, there are two transverse arteries: palmar metaphyseal artery and palmar carpal artery. So on the palmar side, this is the perineal quadratus. There is this part, so you can take this part or you can take this part. So I take from here, okay? So here, distal, just distal to the perineal quadratus, there's a transverse artery going across here and supplying the bone. And if you take the perineal quadratus out, you see all this vascular splash. So you take this bone out from here, okay? Just proximal to the joint. And I'll show you, and this is the, this is the place you take bone. And these are, I will skip these studies. So here's a proximal pole non-union, one, two ICSRA. This is on the operating table taking a bone graft on the pedicle and putting it, opening it up. This is putting it in and screw fixation goes up the heel. Outcomes are good. If you do a good job and don't kill the pedicle, the outcomes are good. So, and you can take it on the volar surface on the pronator quadratus and fix it up. Or you can take this palmar metaphyseal branch. This is an article by Hill Hastings and uh, Greg Summerkamp. And you can take, this is just distal to the perineal quadratus. You can take best blood uh, bone on this and it'll reach the scaphoid very nicely. And this is the part that you take. And you take bone and you put it onto the scaphoid and you can reconstruct the scaphoid. You get nice quality bone. So here is the bone fixed with a screw, and here it is. This is my case, non-union of the scaphoid. So non-union of the scaphoid, which was uh, fixed with a bone graft from here, and you see the scaphoid's not healed. So we put a, a palmar graft and we put a plate in there and this goes on to heal. So the, you can use the uh, bone from uh, uh, medial femoral condyle and this is bone from medial femoral condyle um, taken with a cartilage for very complex proximal pole non-unions resulting in good healing. So vascularized bone graft only for cases which are very complex, like this one, which is which has multiple fixation with uh, percutaneous fixation. Patient has developed infection, you see, and avascular necrosis and non-union, a trifecta and defect. So this is a complex one, and this draining sinus, which, is, which was uh, debrided, 
And uh, once this bone is debrided, we take a vascularized bone graft and fix it as a cantilever, just as a screw, just to prevent it from popping out. This the uh, screw was uh, in the graft was in there, and patient got a full range of motion and good reconstruction. So we'll skip about nonlinear. What's new? Well, new thing is uh, plate fixation. Uh, plate fixation is great. It'll get you out of a lot of trouble. You have to be very careful in doing this and learn the technique. Bowler plate fixation. Greg Bain has also done dorsal plate fixation. We'll discuss it in our book. And these are uh, from Scott Edwards from Phoenix. And then there is uh, computer assisted uh, correction of the scaphoid. Uh, normally we do the scaphoid correction as Fernandez taught us, but uh, uh, Larry Nagy from uh, Zurich, Switzerland has shown us that you can do a computer assisted correction and you get a very accurate correction. Salvage procedure, the bend zones, ex that is this, uh, an excision of the distal pole of the scaphoid. This will buy you a number of years. Radial stylodectomy, or you can do snack procedures, this proximal row carpectomy, or uh, limited carpal fusions, wrist innovations, complete wrist orthodesis or wrist fusions, uh, or wrist orthoplasties, PRCs, or uh, four corner fusions or ultimately wrist arthrodesis. So this is a uh, final plug for the broken scaphoid coming out uh, with uh, myself, um, Chai Mudgal from Boston, Randy Bindra from uh, Australia and Joe Dyes from England. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hamid. I think uh, uh, we did not understand that it happened to be one hour talk and uh, Really, you know, uh, amazed uh, that how does this one hour goes off? Uh, uh, such a wonderful talk. We could not take uh, eyes out of a, any any of the presentations, any of the slides. Uh, your uh, experience in uh, more than uh, 300 and odd scaphoids, and then uh, your experience algorithm in uh, acute fractures, uh, diagnosis, and of course in non-union. Um, I think it's incredible and amazing. Uh, the viewers must be lucky today uh, to have you uh, talk uh, for the entire one hour. Uh, it did not, uh, you know, I didn't ever knew that the one hour just passed. I think I should uh, allow you to speak for at least half a day about scaphoid. And then also uh, we would love to you know, know more, much and much more thing about scaphoid. Every, every talk I hear from you, uh, I learn many things. Uh, everything is new for us. Uh, we will give Dr. Amit a break. Probably he can have a coffee or a a couple of uh, you know uh, water and then uh, we will uh, come back to you with some questions meanwhile okay uh, we, we have uh, uh, dr olivier and uh, dr ignacio uh, they are also like equally a finest uh, surgeons who deal with uh, scaphoid and other reconstructive procedures um, let's uh, have a few uh, comments from them and then probably we'll come back with questions um, first we'll go to dr olivier uh, please uh. Ah. hello um Thank you for your talk. It was incredible and very uh, precise, and you've described everything. It was a very great talk. I got just one question about uh, non union. Do you always try to reduce all the deformity that you have in the scaphoid? Because uh, in my team in Montpellier, we have described that when we make a big reduction of the DZ deformity, uh, most of the people who have the follow up when they heal, they still have pain because maybe the DZ was. For so long time in the place in the, in the wrist, so they have pain. So now, when we have a um, patient, we have a disease deformity for a long time. We not try to reduce at the other side. We are the same. We sometimes accept um, an under reduction of the disease deformity. Do you have this experience or not? Yeah, it has been yeah, shown that been shown. if you have uh, DZ deformity for a long time, it's a problem. And that's what I showed you Nakamura's um, paper, that if you have uh, a long-standing DZ and long-standing non-union for five years, patients are still symptomatic, even if, the, <laughs> if, if the fracture heals. And that is true. So I try to reduce the fracture and try to um, you know reduce the DZ by doing the uh, technique using a, uh, a joystick into, this, into the lunate. Or you can just open up the two poles of the scaphoid, and as you open up the scaphoid gap uh, in in both planes, then you'll be able to reduce the DZ deformity. You can do it two ways. You can flex the flex the wrist like this, and and put your uh, guide wire into the lunate, 
and then as you extend, it will stop the lunate from going going into DZ anymore. Okay. And once you do that, you will see that the gap, the two joysticks open up and you that gives you amount of uh, bone graft that you need to put in. And then you can, you can add a little bit of radial styloidectomy with it because that will take away and you can also do a denovation if you really wanted to do that. Yes, thank you. Uh, you, you please unmute yourself, Dr. Oliver, please unmute yourself. Uh, one other question for you is, uh, you have described when you have the non-union, do you make uh, grafting with uh, under arthroscopy uh, processes or you don't? Or I, do, I, do arthroscop I do arthroscopic grafting for limited situations. When there are, there's a, like a delayed union with a cystic, sometimes you'll see the cystic die back and there's a slight displacement. I'll do a mid carpal arthroscopy. I'll reduce the frac reduce the uh, fracture, and then I will drill. Uh, I'll put the guide wire, uh, K wire, and then I'll drill, and then I'll put a Jamshidi needle and put bone graft, um, Kinsella's bone graft through the Jamshidi needle into the uh, defect, and then I'll put the screw in. So in a delayed union and early non-unions and nascent non-unions, I'll do the uh, arthroscopic grafting. But if the grafting, if the deformity is too much, then I'll do an open um, volar grafting. Yes, and then, then normally I'm I'm using the plate nowadays. Okay, it's great. I do the same thing when I have a small deformity. I will do arthroscopy because mm -hmm. I think uh, you preserve most of the ligaments and all the things are around. And when okay. there is a big deformity, I think maybe plates. I don't have your experience, but I think it's a great improvement. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Ignacio. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for your incredible talk. You've, you've gone through almost all the topics around the scaphoid. I would like to make you two questions. The first one, is there any place for the metaphysical core decompression within your practice, especially maybe in the context of uh, proximal pole non-unions or, or proximal pole fractures, where vascularity in the scaphoid is quite... Um, uh, well, it might be this vascular. And the second one, uh, Dr. Roos in, in Duke University, they have started recently using two screws instead of one. What are your thoughts on that? I'll answer your first question. Yeah, we do sometimes use the, um, you know, graph that you mentioned, but in my practice, I find it very difficult. You know, people are not accepting uh, a, a, a graph from the knee. And we have to convince them very heavily that we really need that. And in many instances, I can get by. I think I have very rare instances where there is cartilage defect also, uh, and and patients have had multiple procedures. In those situations, then you decide whether salvage is better than uh, doing a very complex procedure or not, and you have a discussion with the patient. So, in most instances, I find that the patients are not accepting of that and they want to go to salvage procedure rather than go for a very complex uh, multi hour um, microsurgical procedure with chances of failure. The second one is yes, two, two screws and biomechanically two screws have been shown to be better than one screw. Um, and Joe Slade used to put two screws for scaphoid fracture. All the things I can emphasize is stability, stability, stability. Stability is the key. If you stabilize the fracture, the fracture will heal. Doesn't matter how vascular or non-vascular it is. Forget it. You you stabilize it, the fracture will heal. So if you can stabilize it with one, two, three, four screws, that's fine. Or you can put in a plate. Plate is a very good stable structure for this complex non-unions. Okay, now that you have entered into the, the, the stability concept, I have two more uh, questions. The first mm -hmm. one, how important do you think is to, to, to put the, the, the longest screw that you can? And the other one, there are like two schools within a cannulated screws. Uh, one school usually says you have to put your screw in the scaphoid axis and the other one, Says, says that you should put, insert your screw the, the perpendicular to the fracture. So, for example, in the context of uh, long oblique fractures where it's not transverse, do you prefer to go 90 degrees within the fracture or you just 
put your screw in the axis? I tried to put it in the axis. I follow the uh, things that, uh, they, that came out of uh, Washington University uh, and uh, the paper uh, showed biomechanically that center center fixation is the best. So, so here I want to emphasize, and I didn't put that in my talk, that if the fracture is through the waist, then you decide whether you want to go dorsally or want to go volarly. Okay. If it's more towards the proximal pole, you go from the from the dorsal side. If it's more towards the distal pole, I go from the uh, volar side. But um, I try to go center center as much as possible, especially for fractures. For non-unions, when you're putting a bone graft, you don't have to go center center. It is better to go slightly volar, then you can compress the fracture a little bit better than if you go uh, center center. If you go center center, the graft may extrude out. And when you're putting the uh, putting the screw, you have to put your thumb in there, keep the graft in place so that you don't uh, extrude the graft out. Thank you, Dr. Amit. Um, uh, Dr. Amit, I think uh, uh, there's, we can take one more question because uh, there are a lot of questions from the viewers. A lot of lot of questions, loads of questions. Um, probably the toughest question is when do you choose? Uh, uh, vascularized and a non-vascularized bone graft in scaffold non-union. Okay, I'll tell you exactly what I do. Vascularized, if you want to reconstruct the shape and the geometry of the scaphoid, very difficult to, to get a proper vascularized bone graft for that unless you take a medial femoral condylar graft, okay? So in that case, my selection is for a non-vascularized bone graft. And as I said, I, I emphasize on stability. My indication for non-vascularized bone graft is when there is a disvascular scaphoid, which is the proximal pole non-unions, and patients have had multiple surgeries. Sometimes I'll use a hybrid. I'll use a vascularized, non-vascularized bone graft to, to reconstruct, and then I'll use a volar palmar metaphyseal arterial graft into the, into the scaphoid on the dorsal side before I put a plate or a screw on top of that to stabilize it. So it's a it's a hybrid op, uh, procedure with a non-vascularized and a vascularized graft. But mostly I use a non-vascularized graft to reconstruct the geometry of the scaphoid and I rely on my stability. And your choice from the non-vascularized bone graft if the distal radius or you're still going to the iliac crest? Go to the crest. Um, um, I've, you know, we've tried the, uh, the, the, uh, Ma Garcia Elias, uh, dorsal, uh, graft, and I did a, about 10 of those cases. Um, I've had fairly good results with that, but I, I preferred the crest because I think that's a much better graft. You can use Cancellus, you know, compact Cancellus graft. You put the Cancellus graft in a syringe, compact it and pack it in. And that works pretty well. And especially if you're using a plate, compact cancellous graft works perfectly fine. Thank you, Dr. Amit. Um, I think most of the questions from the audience, like Dr. Amit from India, uh, Dr. Dung from uh, Indonesia, uh, John Ho, um, and many other, Dr. Adhanan, they all have common questions, and those questions are probably the answer, Dr. Amit. Uh, we will have a quick closing remarks uh, from the um, from the marketers, and then finally uh, a couple of uh, take home message from Amit Gupta. Um, Dr. Oliver, your final closing remarks. Uh, I have just a, a remarks. Uh, what do you think is the place of the plate for uh, compared to the screws? Because uh, you said stability is the key, so why not use the plate all the time? Um, I'm coming to that. <laughs> I, I, it's 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 a it's a, it's a uh, you know evolution process, and I like the plates, but um, you know the, the for simple fractures, uh, it's quicker, easier to do, percutaneous. I use the screw fixation. If I have to open it and it's a complex fracture, I'm using the plate more and more. Okay. Thank you for that. I really want to try it. Yeah, it's it's good. You'll love it. Uh, Dr. Oliver, your closing remarks. My closing remarks. Uh, for uh, um, Thank you, Dr. Amigupta, for your great talk. And uh, I think that uh, what I've been changing in my practice, maybe I will use plates. 
for complex fractures. And maybe after we will try for less complex fractures, but I will still continue to use um, arthroscopic uh, for non-union when it's sure. at the beginning, because we have very nice results. We're making a series with uh, multiple centers for the end of the year. And I will be very happy to share with you the results because we uh, we have a series about uh, more than 200 cases. So it will be nice to see and the place of the indication. But uh, you talked is very great. You have uh, really stepped forward for the treatment for each case of fractures and displaced, displaced, non-union and whatever. And I think that uh, at the end, uh, when you have your all this stuff, we can talk about the salvage process. It can be a long, long talk again, because uh, it's so passionate for all that. Is there's many options. And uh, I think there is nobody who knows exactly what is the truth about that. And okay. thank you again for your talk. It was really great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Terence, for the invitation. Thank you. Well said, Dr. Oliver. I think uh, you have uh, echoed my thoughts. Um, Oliver, don't worry. We will be saving you for the upcoming webinar. So we will disturb you in the future. Um, Dr. Ignacio, we will also be troubling you. Um, so we just need your convenient time and date uh, in the up the upcoming webinars. Uh, Dr. Ignacio, your uh, I mean, thoughts and uh, closing remarks. I would like to just uh, use the same some words of Dr. Gupta just to uh, to remember the, the bad actors for and bad prognosis for the scaffolding union. Those are displaced fractures, unstable, the ones that are uh, with uh, carpal instability and proximal pole fractures. Those are the bad actors that you and that's the, my take home message for today. Thank you and well said. Dr. Amit Kuta, I think. Uh, uh, your uh, final closing remarks, and uh, we have viewers worldwide uh, because it's being aired live through uh, Facebook and YouTube. Um, those are the viewers who will be watching at uh, their convenient time, and they'll have multiple viewers uh, because being a you know well experienced surgeon, uh, your closing remarks on the scaphoid, broken scaphoid, scaphoid fractures, and non-union. Thank you, Terence, for inviting me for this um, okay. wonderful seminar uh, webinar. And thank you, Dr. Ignatia and Dr. Oliver. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Um, now, the the thing is that most scaphoid fractures, which are non-displaced, can be managed in a cast for four to six weeks and then CT scan. And if they're non-displaced, they'll heal. If you see cystic change, if you see separation, if you see displacement, uh, or if you have a fracture which is displaced, comminuted, carpal instability, uh, or deformity uh, or proximal pole fractures. These are the ones that are bad actors and should be treated primarily. The rest, if they're stable, they will heal in a cast. And the uh, and if you get a non-union, then the thing to do is to analyze the non-union with a CT scan. And if you see the deformity, then you will do a volar approach with a grafting. If there is stable non-union, you can fix it with an arthroscopic fixation, with possibly addition of arthroscopic bone grafting. So that's in summary what my take in scaphoid fractures is. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. I think uh, it was well explained. Uh, well concluded to the audience. I think if you if anyone asks uh, Dr. Amit, what are the three things which you you know obviously want to emphasize in scaphoid is stability, stability, stability. I think wow, it's amazing and well you know, shared and will um, uh, explain to the audience. Um, thank you, Dr. Amit, um, for such a wonderful uh, you know, time sparing with us. Um, we wish you all the best for the grasping hand, the broken scaphoid, and many more to come in the future. Thank you, Dr. Ignacio, Dr. Oliver, and wishing you all safe and healthy. Good night and good evening. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you.